Play ball. Hey, new baseball fans, and welcome to another edition of the Brushback with J.P. Ricciardi. I'm John Arezzi, and let's bring him right in. He's a guy that spent 43 years in the game, former general manager of the Toronto Blue Jays, front office executive for the A's, the Giants, the Mets, the baseball lifer, J.P. How you doing, J.P.? Good, John. How you doing? I'm doing okay. You know, I think uh, as I just commented before we started this, I'm kind of like uh, your Ed McMahon a little bit, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's here, yeah. my Johnny Carson. Uh, yeah. But I'm really enjoying this. We got a great one today. You're bringing on really one of the elite pitchers that have been out there. And uh, uh, Tim Hudson, my, my goodness, what a, what a great story career he's had. Yeah, you go back and look at his career. I, I think that he had almost seven or eight years of 200 plus innings. Uh, the consistency, the athleticism, you know, the one of those guys that every fifth day you knew what you were going to get. You're going to get six, seven, eight innings out of a guy that would compete, keep his team in the game. Uh, and then you look up the body of work that he's done. I mean, he was a World Series winner. He was an all star. Cy Young votes. Um uh, you know, 15, 16, 17 wins a season, came to the big leagues right away and started to win and produce. So it's an amazing career when you look back at it. And, uh, you know, something that I think is a dying breed in our game, which is pretty sad to say, you know, starters who take the ball and give you 30 starts and give you 200 plus innings uh, and and don't mind pitching past the fifth inning and the third time through the order. So Tim Tim is one of the good ones, and uh, as good of a player he was, he's he's that good a person. I think people are going to really enjoy his take on pitching today. And you go way back with him. Go back to the year he was drafted. You know, by uh, by us in Oakland. Uh, you know, we were in Oakland at the same time, and he pitched on those teams that we. You know, my first few years in Oakland. Uh, we weren't a very good team, and then we became a very good team, 88, 89, 90, 91, 92, and then we kind of went back downhill a little bit, and then Tim was part of the uh, resurgence of the second second wave of good teams from 2000 right through uh, 2002 I left, but I was there 16 years, and he was a part, big part of the end of it, and uh, him and Mulder and Zito along with Giambi and Chavez and uh, Hernandez, a lot of guys we drafted and signed, so it was, it was a really uh, – it was a good time to be in Oakland. Yeah, it was, and that uh, those three pitchers that you mentioned, him with Zito and Mulder, I mean, that was a great trio. It was a great trio. Yeah, you know, the nice thing about them was they came to the big leagues and just gave you innings and won, so it yeah. wasn't like we had to go through any growing pains with them. They, yeah. were, all, uh, they were all at the top of their game. Yeah, uh, so, I mean, this kind of leads into uh, what we're going to do with your hot takes because <clears throat> we have been following the stories of some of the pitchers that have been out there, and so kind of this is kind of a tale of uh, of different pitchers and where they are uh, and what has happened to them recently. And and the guy that you've been talking to on this podcast uh, several times uh, was actually brought up to the majors. Finally, Paul Skeens with the Pittsburgh Pirates and made his debut, uh, a very impressive debut uh, this past weekend. Uh, and you look at, uh, at, at Skeens. I mean, he is uh, he's been called. Uh, the greatest pitching prospect of his generation uh, just last year uh, featured that triple digit fastball wipeout slider uh, to the heights of the college world series uh, signed by the pirates. And he went up the ladder very, very quickly. Uh, and uh, his stuff is just phenomenal. Uh, I do have a couple of questions about schemes, but I first, I want to get your take on his debut. Well, you know, first time in the big leagues, first time touching the mound in the big leagues, you never know what's going to happen. But I think there's a lot of positives to take away from it. Uh, his, I think he threw 17 fastballs over 100 miles an hour. So, mm -hmm. you know, he's got all the velo you want to see from a fastball. I think the things that he's going to have to work on are all what young pitchers have to work on, how to get hitters off the fastball a little bit. He's got to develop his change up a little bit more and just refine everything. But this kid's going to be fine. Barring any kind of injury, he's – the one of the best amateur pitchers I have ever scouted in all my years of scouting. And it's a long time. Uh, and I think the pirates, I'm glad they finally brought him to the big leagues. I thought they've taken a long time to get him there, but I see this kid just keep building and building and building and realizing what he can do and what he can't do. But uh, if this guy doesn't have success, then I don't know who's going to have success in the big leagues. He's a big, strong kid, uh, young. He just got lightning fast stuff. And but the thing that I've been really just kind of analyzing is he did so well 
in his amateur career on the College World Series. He gets signed by the Pirates, and automatically they're putting him on pitch limits. All right, so you, and he went up the ranks, but you know you're going to pitch forty pitches this game, and then you're coming out after sixty pitches, and then even in Triple A, yeah. the same thing. And then he goes to the majors, and eighty pitches, he's out of the game. Uh, for a guy like that, with his stuff, and and this is really a question for you for all pitching today and how they're brought up when. Or if, is it ever going to happen again where you just let a guy go based on his potential and say, all right, now it's you're taking the bump, pitch the game? Well, I, I think what's happened is it's the way they're being groomed in the minor leagues. So if you've only groomed this guy to go 80 pitches in the minor leagues, you can't get him to the big leagues and ask him to go 120. So I understand what they're doing from that standpoint. But what I don't understand is if we want starters in the big leagues, and Skeen is definitely a starter, he's a guy who's built to go – more than five innings. So we've got to start developing these guys in baseball. We've got to start letting them go past the fourth and fifth inning in the minor leagues. Why teams are doing it, I, I think I got a pretty good idea because they want to get to the bullpens real fast. But I still believe that the team that has a dominating number one starting pitching, and you could go all through history, where, where do you want to start? Those teams, when they get in the playoffs, are the teams that are hard to beat because you have to beat that guy three times to win a World Series. Don Drysdale, Sandy Koufax, Bob Gibson. Uh, you know, we could go on and on and on. DeGrom, Verlander, Scherzer. Uh, every team wants those guys. The Pirates have that guy. So there's no reason they should be holding him back. And I hope that now he can throw another 15 to 20 pitches and get into at least 100 pitches and be able to get them into, you know, the sixth, seventh, eighth inning. Uh, so that's probably why he could he only threw 80. But I think it's up to these organizations to build these guys up a little bit more uh, in the minor leagues. Yeah, it's just definitely becoming a lost art with those guys that you mentioned who used to go. I mean, they all went eight innings. They all went nine innings. They all pitched after, you know, it's a well, different we're, era. We're, but... The other thing we're doing is we're losing the entertainment value because yeah. people are excited to see Paul Skeen's pitch. So they're going to go buy tickets the day Paul Skeen's pick, pitches. They're not going to go to the ballpark to watch an opener. I've never seen anybody say, wow, there's an opener pitching today. I can't wait to go to the game. But if you go back through history, you know, Dave Steve, Jim Palmer, uh, Frank Tanana, Bob Gibson, I mentioned earlier, you know, all these guys, Earl Hershiser, those guys are on the mound. People get excited, especially if you're a kid and you're a pitcher and you say, I want to go see this guy pitch. So I think we're doing our game an injustice by not using the entertainment value to to tap into these their talent and and you know sell tickets. Yeah, and even pitching duels when you had two top hurlers going against each other and they're going seven, eight, nine innings against each other, it's, even in a one even yeah. in a one nothing game, yeah. it, it, it was exciting and you would yeah. your seat watching the game. So anyway. That's what's going on there. Uh, that was just kind of a little uh, – I wanted to vent a little bit about that because I'm like, yep. what is it going to stop when you have these kids who are so talented? Let them go. Yep. Uh, uh, on the other side of the coin, you have a grizzly old veteran out there who is so respected, and he is coming back from a little setback injury-wise, but he's in there now, and uh, he took the mound uh, in Houston. And I'm talking about the ageless Justin Verlander. He held the Tigers hitless over the first two and third innings on route to a seven innings of shutout ball, striking out eight this past weekend, allowing just two hits, uh, leading Houston to a 9-3 victory. Uh, Verlander uh, is just kind of this 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 gamer, and he's like he's got something to prove, it, it looks like. Uh, well, so your take on him? I think with Verlander, the thing people uh... – should take away. This is what I take away from Verlander is he knows how to pitch and it's a lost art. He knows how to add and subtract. He knows how to go up and go down. He knows how to set hitters up. And the older you get as a pitcher, you have to have that ability to be able to control the tempo and know what you can and can't do. And I think the thing that I'm most amazed with Verlander is he's always been a guy who threw hard. Everything was power stuff. Now he has the ability to back off a little bit, to locate his fastball, to be in different quadrants, to know when to do this and when to do that. And I think you've seen an amazing evolution of a great pitcher who's a Hall of Famer who is showing people how to pitch. And I think if I'm a young kid out there and I'm watching someone today to show me how to pitch, Verlander would be the guy because he's not 
sitting 97, 98 like he once did. He's still throwing pretty good, but he's pitching more than I think he ever has. And it's it's great to watch the evolution of an older pitcher. It is. And he sits right now at uh, 29.1 innings for the season. He has an interesting uh, contract situation. He needs 140 innings pitched this year for a $35 million vesting option to kick in for the 2025 season. And ironically, half of that gets paid by the Mets. Uh, so uh, do you think that that, that incentive – or is, is he just kind of like, I'm a winner, I want to go out a winner, I may have one year left in me? Uh, does that $35 million vesting option even mean anything to him at this point? It's a lot of money. Well, but- listen, I don't know anybody who's going to look at $35 million and say, I could just throw that out the window. So I'm sure yeah, he's he's motivated dollars. by that, which anybody in the world would be. But yeah. I think if you look at it, he's on pace. I mean, he's if he gets through June... Uh, he's going to be up to 60 innings. He gets through August. He's up to, you know, about 90 innings. So I, I think it's well within his grasp, obviously, barring any kind of setback. But, yeah. yeah, the money – and it should be a motivator for these guys. I mean, that's yeah. what they play for. They only got a short time to do it. So uh, I think he's got two things going for him. I think he's got a lot of pride. And I also think he uh, – he want he's you know, he's going to cash in on the money. But the flip side of this is what if the Astros came to Verlander – in july and said listen we're not going anywhere we're going to start trading guys what if we could trade you would you be willing to you know okay a trade so we could send you to someone who might be a contender and get in the playoffs and that would be interesting to see what his take on that is because i gotta believe he's an amazing competitor and he'd rather pitch in the world series if he had an opportunity so don't be surprised if verlander uh gets traded and wouldn't it be ironic if he goes back to the mets who were paying half of that salary anyway (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah well that would be an interesting situation for sure. Um, and the New York. The Mets got to start winning, John. The Mets got to start winning. Yeah, I know. I, you know, I'm, I'm watching Edwin Diaz uh, meltdown, and it's just sad to see right now. So, anyway, uh, let's not talk about the Mets because then I'll get all upset here. Uh, but we are going to talk about somebody that we have discussed here on this uh, show uh, several times. We've been watching him closely, and that's Alec Manoa. Uh, he pitched like it was 2022. This past Sunday, he got uh, into uh, the seventh inning. Uh, he shut out in the first six innings. He was shutting out the Minnesota Twins. He had 78 pitchers to get through that performance. And then he gave up three runs in the seventh, even though they were unearned. He still gave up a home run, a walk. Uh, with a guy who everyone has been watching to pitch six innings of great ball bringing back a couple of years ago and then him going back out to the seventh. Was that, was that a strategic mistake? Perhaps you should have let this guy just pitch into the sixth and let him out. I think it's up to the manager to have his finger on the pulse on that. Uh, if he's in the sixth inning and he doesn't have a high pitch count, obviously you run him out for the seventh. My, my uh, thought process on this is if you're going to run him out for the seventh, as soon as he starts to have a little bit of trouble, I get him out of the game. I let him leave on a good note. And I, I'm encouraged to see Manoa is making strides. And every time out, he seems to be getting better and better and better. Uh, I think it's up to the manager to be able to get him out on a good note, let him continue to feel good about himself. Uh, but there's a lot of good signs happening for Manoa now. He's getting deeper in the games, he, more positive results. Um, so I think this is all plus and, and the arrows going up for him and the Blue Jays. Yeah, you know, well, that would be a great thing for those Toronto fans who've had a rough season so far, and uh, they're just chomping at the bit for a turnaround up there in Toronto for sure. And finally, I want to talk about the comeback of Chris Sales now uh, in Atlanta Brave. Uh, he had such a horrific last couple of years with fractured ribs, broken fingers, uh, just, and then he had the stress reaction um, in the shoulder uh, for 2023. He gets traded traded from the Red Sox to the Braves, and now seven games in, five and one, two point nine five ERA. The comeback of uh, Chris Sales is something to really take a look at. What's your take on that? Yeah, I got to uh, watch him the other night on TV, and he looked like the old Chris Sale. I mean, his breaking ball was really good. Uh, his fastball had a lot of velocity on it, a lot of movement, especially up and away to right-handed hitters. I think it's a great trade by uh, Alex Anthopoulos. Uh, and it's a shot in the arm for them because they've had a couple of injuries to their staff. And this is like found gold. You know, no one was expecting this. And he's really stepped up and really given them a shot in the arm. So 
right now he's the comeback player of the year for me in in, uh, in the National League. But uh, it's been good to see. It's been good to see for the Braves. I mean, if you're a Braves fan, you got to be sitting there saying, "Wow, you know, we weren't expecting this." So um, it's nice to see this guy bounce back. I know he's had a couple of years of rough injuries, and you know, in Boston, it just seemed to be a, 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 the last few years just. It wasn't a, it was an ugly situation. So happy for the player that he's bouncing back. Happy for the the Braves that they they hit on the trade and uh, you know be interesting to see how he holds up because he hasn't really gone you know over 150 innings over the last few years. So he may hit a little bit of a, a point in the season where he gets fatigued and they're probably gonna have to back him off a couple of times. But right now, I mean, your first two months of the season, you got to be happy with what he, where he's at. Oh yeah, he's definitely got to be, and the Braves are happy to have him there. All right, uh, JP, uh, thank you for your takes for this week. And now it's time for our special guest. Now it's time for the Batter Up with JP. A four-time All-Star, our guest on Batter Up, pitched in the Major Leagues for three teams, including the Oakland A's, Atlanta Braves, and San Francisco Giants from 1999 to 2015. He racked up 222 wins during his career, was the AL leader in wins in 2000, got the Comeback Player of the Year in 2010, has a World Series ring from the 2014 World Champion Giants. He's also a member of of the Atlanta Braves Hall of Fame. It's a pleasure to bring on the brushback with JP, Tim Hudson. How are you doing, Tim? I'm I'm great. How are y'all doing? I appreciate y'all having me. Tim, thanks for doing this. I appreciate it. Seems like uh, yesterday you were in Oakland A and I was watching you move up the ladder. And I'll never forget in 1999, Billy says to me, do me a favor, go up to Tacoma, Hudson's pitching. He goes, go watch him pitch and tell me if he's ready for the big leagues. So I go up to Tacoma, and it's a typical Hudson start. You pitch great. Billy calls me in like the second inning, and I said, Billy, what are you waiting for? I said, he's better than the guys we got now. You got to get him up to Oakland real fast. We could use him. And uh, the rest is history. You just took off. You, you, you had an amazing career. But, you know, what I want the listeners to know more importantly is not only is Tim a great player, a great athlete, he's a great husband, he's a great father, He's just a great guy. And if we had more guys like him in our game, our game would be such a pleasure. So thanks for doing this, Tim, and welcome. I appreciate you. I mean, those are nice, uh, nice comments. And, you know, it was, uh, man, it, those, those, it seemed like it was so long ago. Uh, I guess it was, actually. I guess we're kind of getting a little long in the tooth. But, um, yeah, you know, I, I love the opportunities that, that Billy and the Oakland Athletics Organization gave me. It was it was a perfect scenario for me. And, uh I couldn't have picked a better organization to break into. Well, you, you, your timing was great. Um, and I believe John Poloni signed you, right? He did. He did. He was a scout yeah. that signed me. And, um, you know, he was a guy that, I mean, he really, he worked for me. You know, I was, I was a pretty undersized right-handed pitcher in the SEC. My numbers were really good. But, you know, if you looked at me in a uniform back then, I, I didn't jump out to you as, as, hey, man, this is a can't-miss prospect. Um, you know, so he uh, he really – you know, push for me and, you know, thank goodness you guys, you know, listened to what he had to say and was able to actually draft me probably a couple of rounds uh, before a lot of teams had me on their boards. Well, no, no, in the Oakland way, you were a senior. So uh, everything worked in our favor. <laughs> yeah, it was a little bit of a discount. You know, I'll, I'll, sign, I'll sign for, you know, give me a hot dog and a plane ticket. I'll be there. So I ask everybody this question because I know what the game means to me. Um, when did you first fall in love with the game? Oh, gosh. Um, you know, honestly, it's hard to, to say when. Um, you know, that ba- baseball is the one sport that I knew um, I had a God-given gift to be able to play it. I was a small kid growing up. Um, I had some ability. I, there was nowhere, no other place that I had rather have been than, than playing baseball. And, you know, whether it was on a field or in the front yard with my dad playing catch or or what have you. And, um it was the one thing, I mean, I didn't have a lot going on as far as ability wise and other sports. I was a small, I didn't play basketball. I didn't play football. Um, you know, and, and baseball was just something that was, uh, was a natural love for me. Um, so it's hard to say when that was, I just knew that, um, you know, you love something when every time, uh, almost every minute, of every day, you're kind of wondering, you know, when, when can I get to the ballpark? 
So we'll we'll get into your career as we go into this. But what what I really want to touch on early in this uh, this conversation is, you know, you pitched a long time at a very high level. You're a great athlete. You could repeat your delivery. You did a lot of things right. And today, I'm really alarmed by the arm injuries in our game. And I'm curious to see what your take is on it and what your thoughts are on why. Uh, and you can elaborate as long as you mm -hmm. want on this because I've been picking everybody's brain that we have on. And uh, it's disappointing to see so many good arms end up getting hurt. And so many uh, – it used to be we look for pitchers like you and let them develop and let them pitch. And now we look like we're looking for velocity and trying to teach them how to pitch. And it seems like it's backwards. But what what are your thoughts? Well, uh, I, th I think there's there's a few things, and it's hard to say what's uh, you know what's the main culprit of of it. Um, you know, I think a lot of it is kids are are you know the tread on their tire is worn down pretty quickly uh, as they're playing youth baseball. Uh, there's a lot of kids that are, that are baseball specific at a young age, and, and even position specific for pitchers. You know, so kids are logging a lot more throws, a lot more, a lot more pitches early in their career, in their youth. So in turn, as you get a little bit older, you know, in, in high school, you're, you know, they probably have the wear and tear of a college kid, and in college, they have the wear and tear of a of a professional player along the way. So I think that can have something to do with it, and a, and a, a big reason for that um, why they're playing so much is because you know travel baseball. Uh, has gotten to be so big when it comes to, uh, you know, kids getting recruited um, in, in high school. Um, you know, high school baseball is kind of taking a back seat to summer ball. And, and and a big reason is because, you know, during the summertime is when a lot of these college recruiters can get out and see kids, right? They they can be, they can see them firsthand. So there's, if they can play 60, 70 games, you know, they're going to, they're going to, get out there and play because there may be 15 or 20 college scouts in the stands watching a particular team or a particular tournament. So because kids don't want to get lost in the shuffle, you know, they're playing a lot of games. They're, they're, they're throw, making a lot of throws. They're pitching. They're playing the position. So, you know, that wear and tear is, is starting to build up over time. And then as far as, you know, when they do get drafted and they do, do get into organized baseball or even co at the college level, um, you know, there's so much emphasis on, um, you know, spin rate and, and you know, what the pitchers are, are doing with the rap soto and, and the high velocities. You know, everybody's chasing velocity because, you know, back in the day, you know, you may go out there and pitch and you may only see two or three or four, maybe a handful of pitches that are documented from a, from a kid. Now every single pitch that they're making is documented. Everything is gauged. Everything is looked at with a microscope and you know the days of going out there and and, and kind of cruising through a game and then turning the intensity level up you know for eight or ten pitches when you're in a jam those days are kind of gone because they're wanting to show their best stuff every pitch of every game because you know they want scouts to see it they want the college recruiters to see it and you know if they ever just push the the cruise control button you know, scouts may see those eight or ten pitches of the cruise control button and be like, ah, this kid, you know, his numbers, his metrics wasn't that good or what have you. Um, where, whereas that's when you learn how to pitch is when you go out there and you, and you start, you know, moving the ball around and, and pitching at 70 to 80 percent, you know, and, and changing speeds off your fastball and you know, even changing speeds with your fastball. I mean, those days are kind of gone, you know, because every kid don't want to, you know, they don't want to have that tag of, well, he's 87 to 94. You know, they want somebody who's 91 to 96, right? So the kids don't want to stay, you know, they don't want their fastball to be in that upper 80s range anymore. You know, whereas, you know, probably the majority of my games where I pitch really well, my average fastball is probably 89, maybe 90. Um, you know, I could reach back and get a little more if you wanted to, but um, so, that, so that's a little bit of, of – of, of one reason why I think kids, you know, that just that wear and tear of every, every max effort opening the count up O2 with every pitch, making the hitters look funny when they swing and miss, you know, that's all sexy to the scouts and sexy to everybody that's watching. Um, you know, but in, in the long term, it's, it's, it's tough on their arm. And then, and then you fast forward to the big leagues and you have, you know, there's been a lot of, a lot of people talking about the pitch clock and, and this and that. And I think that's definitely a, I think that's an issue. I think it's more of an issue than a lot of people probably want to say. Um, 
because why, why do you why do you think that is Tim the pitch clock? Well, I, I know I pitched in Atlanta where it was 100 degrees on Sunday day games. It's hot, and you know it may not be a big deal early in the game, but as as you start logging a lot of pitches in a game, and you start getting fatigued with your body, and you back up third three or four times in an inning. I mean, sometimes you need to be able to catch your breath. You might need a 30-second timeout, you know, and have the catcher and the pitching coach come out just to let you catch your breath. You know, I think your body's going to lose mechanics. I think you'll you'll start um, not being able to repeat your delivery over and over again. Your arm may drag some because you're 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 tired. Um, and I think and and, and and oh by the way, you got to do it in 15 more seconds. And and the next pitch is 15 seconds. Um, you know, so I think that has something to do with 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 your just your body fatiguing. Add up all the wear and tear that you've had up to that point in your career. You know, and all of a sudden, you know, the new rules start coming into place, and you have you know such a, a short time for your body to you know to catch its breath in between pitches. And you know, I, I think that can just ca- cause added stress to the to your arm, to your shoulder, to your elbow elbow in particular because. When you start getting tired, that's the first thing that's going to be late is your arm getting up and getting ready to pitch. So it's going to drag a little bit and cause a little bit of stress on that ligament. And, you know, but that's not just the only thing. I mean, it's just it's a buildup of a few things. You know, it's the chasing velocity. It's the chasing the rap soto metrics of every pitch, you know, um, and it's the, the wanting guys to swing and miss. And it's a sprint out of the gate for starters. You know, right. they're, they're not expected to pitch in the seventh and eighth inning anymore. You know, so it's like, let me go out there and give you 80 pitches of everything swing and miss and, you know, go from there. But, um, you know, the pitch clock, the pitch clock thing, I think is I'd have a hard time with, even though I'm a, I was a smaller guy, you know, I needed to have a little bit of time. Sometimes, you know, I would cover first a lot. I'd get ground balls to the right side of the infield a lot. So I would have to cover first probably 15 times, 10, 10 times a game. Right, you add those sprints in, and then okay, you got to get back to the mound and make another pitch. You know, it's, it's it'll get you winded, it'll get you tired. I bet some of the heavier pitchers in the game. I don't know what the numbers are, but I bet you if some of the bigger, heavier pitchers in the game over the last couple of years, when the pitch clock stuff came into to account, I bet you their numbers are down. I bet you their you know pitches per game are down. I bet you their ERA is probably batting average against is probably you know some of the some of the highest they've been, I could be completely wrong, but it just seems like it's definitely more of a laboring type of um, type of env- environment, especially for the heavier pitcher. And in, in hot environments, the Kansas Cities, the St. Louis's, the Atlantas, the Miamis, um, you know, it's a different animal. You got I mean, it's it can be hot. It can it can be well. Pitch, yeah, and pitchers don't run anymore. No, <laughs> no. they don't. They don't run pull the poles. They don't run sprints. And I always wonder how that. Uh, effect. I was never a pitcher, but I always was curious how, you know, that they kind of took that off the board. But I always thought that that was part. Uh, guys used to shag fly balls, you know, like like they were outfielders, but just don't seem like pitchers use their legs as much anymore as far as, you know, running. But yeah, I think you're right. I, I know that even when I was at Auburn, uh, you know, there's a lot of strength training. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of strength building with their legs, but there's not a lot of conditioning as far as long distance stuff. And, um, you know, I had to get our guys at, at Auburn, man. I got them on my conditioning program. Um, we had, we had a really, really bad year in 2021. <laughs> and, uh, man, I was like, you know what, we're going to get, I ran with them, uh, you know, a lot of times as, as much as I could. Um, <laughs> but it was like, you know, what'd you do when you played? I was like, all right, I'm going to show you what I did. And we did it. And, and they were in, they loved it. You know, they loved it. It was the striders we did in Oakland, the 10 100s, 10 50s, yep. everything timed, um, you know, and then a, a long, a big cardio day after that. So it was, you know, I think the kids loved it. They loved how they could, you know, pitch later into the games. They felt stronger, you know, as their pitch count got got up a little bit and wasn't as winded whenever they'd have to cover first base a lot or have to back up third a couple of times, you know, they would, you know, they would feel better later in the games. That, that that's interesting because if if you've been around any camps or anything, none of that exists anymore. The guys are throwing bullpens, and as soon as they throw their bullpen, they turn around and someone's charting something. Someone's telling them what their spin rate was. They break their rhythm on the mound. They don't throw their bullpens by themselves or, or on their own. 
and everything's charted. You know, when you think back, like you said, just simple running, you know, it, it creates the strength in your legs. It creates some, you know, a little bit of competition with the other guys. And I think we've gotten away from some of the things that used to work because it's, it's deemed old fashioned. Uh, how, how would you prepare for a season? What would your off season be like? Well, it's, you know, obviously it's such a long year during the, uh, you know, I would, I would never, I never picked up a baseball until um, end of, at, at least after Thanksgiving, you know, in for the beginning of December is when I'd start picking up a baseball and play catch. But that was, you know, that's just the, the arm conditioning part of it when it would start up. You know, I would probably take a couple of weeks off after the season, you know, spend time with the family, maybe maybe a month. Um, and then you get right into your condition, your, your strength training program, you know, your, your weight training, you know, it was a little bit of an old school program. And we, you know, Bob Alejo was our strength coach in, in Oakland and, and he gave us some workouts and I'd never really had a, a, you know, a, a big workout program, you know, growing up. And, you know, it was one of my first tastes of, of what a real strength training program was. And, you know, we'd go in there and spend an hour and a half in the weight room, get your legs strong, get your body strong, get your core strong. And, um, you know, it wasn't a lot of upper body stuff. It was really baseball and, and pitching specific types of, of, uh, exercises and, 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 uh, workout programs. And, um, you know, a lot, and, and with that came the conditioning part of it, you know, getting your body in shape, you know, I really didn't really worry about the conditioning part of it until after the first of the year, uh, you know, coming in, you'd have five, you know, four or five weeks to, you had to report to spring training. Um, so I would, I would concentrate on that in, in January, you know, after the holidays and after, you know, the first of the year, but, um, but you know, I would, I would always want to have a solid eight weeks of not have a, a, of throwing, um, a throwing program to, to not have to rush in rush to get ready for spring training. It was nice and easy at the beginning. And then, um, you know, became, you know, come, uh, spring training and, and the first, uh, you know, week of spring training, you know, I spent that time, I wanted to be ready to pitch when I got to spring training. A lot of, a lot of guys, you know, would use spring training to get ready. And man, I just couldn't allow myself to, to show up, to roll into spring training and feel like I didn't, I wasn't ready to get guys out. I'm not saying I was mid season form by any, any stretch, but I wanted to go, I didn't want to look like a chump when I rolled into spring training. I wanted to roll, I wanted to roll in there and, and all the coaches and the managers and the, you know, everybody look at me and be like, man, that guy, he's ready to get out now, you right. know? And, and I, I, maybe it was just a pride thing or, or the fact that, you know, I always kind of had to prove myself pretty much my whole career, uh, in, in high school and college. And maybe it was just how I was wired, but, um, I didn't want to go in there and get beat around the first couple of weeks of spring training. You know, for one, I mean, it can mess with you mentally. I want to go out there and feel like, man, I'm build, I'm steadily building confidence you know, from the first day of spring training on and then take that until the beginning of the season and just keep it rolling. And you, you were a four pitch guy. You threw a fastball mm -hmm. cutter, curveball, split. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how would you say, cause you could throw those at any time at any count and you had confidence in all of those. How would you, if, for a young kid who's out there listening to this, someone maybe in the minor leagues, that's, Oh, geez, I, I can throw my fastball. I got a slider. Now they're teaching, you know, the sweeper. Uh, but I struggle with my third or fourth pitch. How did you go about keeping the consistency of those four pitches with the confidence to be able to throw them anytime in the count, knowing what maybe your out pitch was? Yeah, well, you know, yeah, the one thing that's really good with all the technology from today is, is you have an idea of, of what your strengths are. Um, you, you know, you can look at all the metrics of all the rep Soto stuff and, and everything and, and understand, okay, this is a really good pitch for my repertoire, for my style of pitching, or this isn't, you know, so you can't have a, I have an idea what your recipe is going to be as a pitcher. Um, you know, I wasn't a four seam guy, so I wouldn't mess with a four seam type of, you know, I, later in my career, I would, you know, mix in some four seams, you know, at the top of the zone, but I knew that that wasn't my bread and butter. Um, you know, but the thing is, is, is like, I would never let whatever my strength is and my identity as a pitcher, I would never let that tool in my belt get dull. I, I would always make sure that whatever I did, that was what made me who I was. And, and that was what, um, you know, that was my go-to. And along my career, you know, I would develop a, a bigger breaking ball, um, a 
along the way. And I started developing a little bit of a change up along with my split. Um, so it's, you, you, you're able to, to work on things. Um, but you know, we still didn't have the rep Soto stuff to kind of help gauge it. You know, for me, it was the pitching coach standing down there with the catcher as like the pitching coach is a hitter. And he would give me instant feedback of what something looked like, you know, or I, you know, you could see it out of your hand and be like, oh, that pitch wasn't very good. Or this one was really good. Or the catcher, you know, you always have to have really good feedback with you and your catcher. Your catcher knows exactly what you're trying to do. And, and he can give you honest feedback of, hey, man, that was pretty good or that, was, that wasn't very good. You might not want to throw that one, you know, in a game. And so it's just that constant feedback of, of, of what your stuff's looking like, um, you know, and, and it's just one of those things where you – but at the end of the day, the hitter's going to let you know what, what you're really good at and what you're not good at. Um, you know, I, I would love – you know, there'd be times when I was at Auburn and, and you know, we had Rap Soto in our bullpens and we were, we were doing stuff and every pitch, you know, every time a pitcher would throw, I mean, you, we would spend, if, if a lot of kids nowadays, if they had their choice, it, it, it'd take them an hour to throw a bullpen because they want to, look, <laughs> they want to look at every pitch. They want to yeah. see what every pitch is doing. Yeah. And you're like, listen, man, I can tell you right now, I'm not a very good hitter anymore, but I, that I would, you'd be backing up third if I was hitting with that pitch. I know the Rap Soto <laughs> may say it looks good. I said, but I'm hitting that. You know, right. and uh, right. so it's, you know, because the one thing that the rap Soto doesn't show, it doesn't show what the deception is of the pitch with the, with the hit, with the pitcher, you know, what side of the plate he's pitching on, you know, different angles. I mean, what side of the rubber the, the pitcher is pitching from, you know, those different angles that a pitcher can create will make the pitch look different to the hitter. The, the metrics are reading the same for the ball spinning and how much break right. it has and all this and that, but what the hitter's seeing could be totally different. From, from what the analytics are telling you about the pitch. And uh, so, I mean, I was, I mean, ever so many times I put a daggum helmet on and I'd stand down there with our, and I'm standing in there watching them throw. And they're like, Ooh, that was nasty. I'm like, man, I saw it out of your hand. Like I, I right. was spitting on that from, it may have, you know, had all kind of crazy horizontal break and this and that. I said, but I'm not swinging at that, you know? Right. And um, so those are things that, you know, once these young pitchers are able to understand, you know, you have the metrics that shows, you know, what the ratings, the balls are doing. That's fine. I said, but at the end of the day, man, you got to, you know, you want that, you want to know what the hitter's seeing and you want to know, you know, what's deceptive and what's not. And, um, and you have to stay in the moment. I mean, if you, you know, if you're making a guy look sick on a slider or a cutter or a split, <clears throat> they tell you don't triple up on it. Why not? I mean, the, the guys just showed you you can't hit the damn thing. <laughs> yeah. There's something about it that he's not seeing. Right. right. Sometimes and, you outthink yourself. What's interesting is you you know you're talking about pitching and continue to pitch and you're still developing. Like you threw a four seam just for something different. You know you threw another pitch just for something different. And I remember talking to Halliday one time in spring training. And I said, Doc, why don't you throw your changeup? He says, uh, You know I don't need another pitch. I said, well, Do me a favor, throw the changeup in spring training because everybody's advancing the team. Everybody's going to go back and tell the hitters now you got a changeup. Even if you never throw the changeup, they're going to think that you have a changeup. So he throws it all spring training. I said, you should throw that five times a game. I said, that'll totally baffle guys. Season starts, he's sinker, cutter, curveball, no sign of a changeup. I said, what happened to the changeup? He goes, ah, I just did it to make you happy. But, <laughs> but it's interesting to hear you, you know, talking about showing something different to the hitters as you – you know, you adapt and you, you evolve as a, as a pitcher. And I wish more pitchers would do that today. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? It's, you know, if you're able to play the game long enough, you better be willing to, to reinvent yourself a couple of two or three times along the way. You know, I was blessed enough to be able to pitch long enough to be, to have to do that. You know, I probably, you know, the kind of pitcher I was at the end of my career is totally different from the pitcher that I was in the middle of my career. Even right. even as a different from the the pitcher at the beginning of my career, so I had to to be willing to reinvent myself, adapt along the way, um, you know, show some some hitters. You know, early in my career, man, I was tipping every pitch because you knew I was throwing a sinker. Hey, here's a sinker. I'm not gonna. I'm not trying to. You know, I'm not trying to sugarcoat anything. But as you get older and you start losing your stuff a little bit, you start losing some velo, you start losing a little bit of life on your ball. You know, you might need to work on back door and a breaking ball a little bit or, or, or front door and a cutter to a right hander. You know, something different to, to show the hitter so that man, now I gotta think about that. 
you know, now I got to think about a change up along with a split. So it's, it's just one of those things where, you, you know, if you're able, if you're hard headed and you're not willing to, to adjust a little bit and you're not willing to reinvent yourself some, you're going to find yourself, it's going to be a lot harder to get out later yeah. in your career. You know, I've seen a lot of guys do it. Um, a, this, a this is not to cut you off, but this is like gold because I'm hoping some of the younger pitchers are out there listening to this because you're talking about location. You're talking about four pitches. You're talking about mastering them. You're talking about being able to evolve, being able to read the hitters, being able to pitch later in the game, which we seem to be getting away from. I don't understand why. Uh, so you're touching on some really, really good topics. The question, I, I, and I find, I always find this amazing with starters what was your bullpen like in between starts? What did you try to accomplish and how long did your bullpens go? Yeah. Well, you know, my bullpen days was, was a, a hard, hard throw day for me. So I'd get all my long tossing in my good conditioning day in, you know, before I would throw my bullpen, uh, long toss and get all that good work. And then I come into the bullpen and, you know, obviously you want to, you know, you want to, dial in a couple of your pitches on both sides of the plate you know your fastballs on both sides of the plate for me i was i wanted to own the bottom of the strike zone i wasn't really concerned with east and west on the on the plate as much as i was just owning that bottom that bottom part of the zone because i knew that was my strength that was what i needed to get to right off the right off the bat and um and and, and you know then obviously i'd go to the corners from that um but once I started kind of feeling like, okay, I'm locating my fastball pretty good. I got a pretty good feel for my, my, my cutter, my, my split, you know, everything's coming out of my hand. Right. And then honestly, I, I would, whoever the, whatever team that I was playing my pitching against my next start, I'm mentally pitching against them for about 15 to 20 pitches. You know, I'm going to throw, you know, whatever their best three or four hitters are in the lineup, the catchers, calling the game as if I'm attacking them and getting them out for, for the next 15 to 20 pitches. So my bullpens are honestly probably anywhere from 30 to 35 pitches, no more than that. Um, but it's, it, you know, I try to make it as much quality as I can. You know, I'm trying to accomplish something on every pitch. Every pitch is if I'm, as if I'm trying to, you know, get guys out, you know, in, in the biggest situation of the game uh, for my next start. Um, you know, because at, at you know that point, you know I'm not really unless I'm struggling and and trying to figure something out. You know why I've, I haven't been pitching well. You know that's one thing. If 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 there's a problem going on in my game and I'm and I'm not throwing the ball that well, then I may spend a little more time trying to figure that out. You know whether it's mechanically or or you know from a delivery standpoint, is something a little bit off. But if 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 things are going well and it's just kind of it's it's. You know, it's just like clockwork. I'm going out there trying to sharpen my skills with my game plan for my next start. <clears throat> um, you know, but a lot of kids, you know, they're going out there trying to, you know, they're trying to learn three, three, three new pitches every bullpen. <laughs> you know, they're trying to figure out how to how to throw a sweeper and then a cutter. And and I'm like, man, it's you know, you, you got to locate your fastball, figure out where where you're throwing that fastball for starters. And, uh, you know, if you, if you have a, one great secondary pitch to follow that, then you're, you're going to be pretty good. Not many people have, you know, two really good secondary pitches to follow a good located fastball. You know, if you know, you, it's if, funny. If you do, just, you're in the, in the big leagues, but they're on them. Yeah. <laughs> I just read, I read something the other day where the Red Sox are getting away from throwing the fastball. And their mindset was that they feel like people can time up the fastball they feel like the old saying of, you know, being able to go uh, glove side is kind of antiquated. Uh, they feel like the sweeper is the pitch. I totally disagree. Mm -hmm. uh, I think if that's your mentality, then my offensive philosophy would be to get my hitters on the plate and look for the ball away and start going to what you think you're going to throw. But I still have a hard time getting my head around Anybody who's a very good pitcher not being able to command his fastball. What are your thoughts on that? I, I think it's key. Listen, and a big reason is because the pitchers don't know how to pitch inside anymore. They don't know how to pitch. Now, I'm not saying just sprinkle one in there. <clears throat> the pitchers aren't willing to go in there and own that inner 
fourth of the plate. And I'm not saying this much on the plate. I'm saying like you got You need to get in there on the chalk. You need to make the hitter know, hey, you know what? You're not just going to be able to eliminate anything middle end. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna go in there, and you're not, and you and you know that I'm going in there with a purpose, and you know because everything is so middle away, the hitters are so comfortable, they don't have to worry about anything coming in on them, um, and and I think that's a big reason is because a lot a lot of pitchers, you know, everything is so up and down now. You know, they're wanting to elevate the fastball up and away, you know, and then chase breaking stuff and. You know, a lot of these uh, a lot of these pitchers aren't comfortable pitching inside, and well, we lost the sinker. They don't want the sinker to be thrown anymore, and it's, I still can't get my head around that one. Yeah. I saw Halliday win a lot of games with a sinker. You had a good sinker. You know, guys with sinkers, you keep the ball off the middle of that bat, and we've gotten away from that too. Yeah, yeah. You know what? I, I agree a hundred percent. And and you know, for me, the way my ball ran and, and if. If I, I mean, I had to own arm side of the plate, right? I mean, if you're a right-handed hitter, you knew that I was coming in there. And what that does is that, that created a, an opening away for me whenever I did want to make a pitch away because they were so conscious in there, um, you know, that they, they wouldn't be able to cover that outside half of the plate whenever I wanted to make that pitch out there. And um, it's, you know, it's just one of those things where it's, um, you know, everything has gotten so – uh, swing and miss and so um, up and down that the East and the West is kind of an afterthought now in, in the game. I think it can be a, I, I, I know that if, if, if you're a guy, who, if you don't throw a hundred miles an hour, if, you, if you're a 91 to 94, if you're not willing to, to pitch inside with authority, you're going to have a hitter that's really, really comfortable in the box and and they're, they're going to, you know, you better have some really, really good swing and miss stuff with it because, you know, it, it's going it's to make your, your job a little harder to get some outs. But at the same time, you know, there a lot of teams aren't willing to, to let a pitcher go out there a third and fourth time through the lineup. You know, the, their third time through the lineup, man, they're trying to get them out of the game to get to a bullpen guy who throws 102 miles an hour, you know. So it's so the games are shortened for the, the starters nowadays for, for whatever reason. Um, you know, but I think if, if there was – if they had a little more, um, if they spend a little more time locating fastballs and being able to to get guys out with your heater a little more the first time through the lineup, you have something to show them in their third time through the order and their fourth time through the order, where you haven't shown them everything that you have right. their first right. time up. Um, you know, so it's and I'm gonna tell you what, man. If I got a dude on in my staff on my staff that's I'm paying him to be an ace. He he's he's my stud, and he can't go three times through the order. I'm kind of wondering why we're paying him so much money. Right. Got the wrong guy, right? I want a dude. If, if, if he's a dude, he's going to be a dude for the seven or eight right. innings. Right. You know, like I want him, I'm paying you to go out there and you're dominating a dude. You're t- like, I'm, I hate taking you out of the game as, as a manager. That is right. how, you know, your fourth and fifth guy in the, or, in the rotation. Okay. Let's, you know, let's maybe third time through the order. Let's see where we're at. Right. See what kind of swings they're taking. Um, you know, but nowadays it's, you know, I don't know. It's like an automatic. Hey, we got to get the bullpen up and get them out of the game. And um, well, they don't let them. They don't let them face adversity. They don't let them fight through anything. You know, they just as soon as it's. I think it's just the mentality of the front offices now. It's the mentality they've, they've pounded it into the managers. You know, there's organizations that don't even let their minor league guys go five innings, and yeah. that to me is the proving ground to let them to, to really let them figure it out. I mean, yeah. the, the games don't matter in the minor leagues. Let those guys figure it out there. Yeah, and and you know, the in the toughest part that that's kind of I'm, it's a head scratcher for me is the pitchers are okay with it. Like, yeah, <laughs> like I don't know. I, I'll probably I know that I'm at, my managers probably hated coming to take me out of the game because I never wanted to come out. You know, it's the fit. If I didn't, if I didn't pitch six innings, I felt like I stunk that day. Right. You know, nowadays it's like if you go out there and pitch for the into the sixth inning, it's like, whoa, man, that guy's he was a stud today. He went past five. Hey, they gave a guy thirty-one million in San Francisco for pitching five innings every start. <laughs> right. I was like, golly. You know, it's like, man, I mean, when I was forty years old and washed up and couldn't hardly get it out, I still felt ticked off when I didn't go at least you know into the sixth inning. Yeah, well, that's why you had such a great career. Uh, so touching on your career, and I, 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 I don't want to keep you here all day, but uh, what in your mind, I know you're a team guy, 
And, you know, I know you're a modest guy, but what are some of your career highlights that you look back and say, you know, I feel really good about that? You know what? It's, gosh, it's hard to say. Um, I, honestly, I mean, it's, it, it seems like every time I think about something in my career, it had something to do with winning with the team. You know, I remember, I remember in 2000 when we won the, uh, you know, we made the, the playoffs for the first time in Oakland. It was because, you know, we stunk, uh, you know, the, yeah. the years leading, I was up, leading up to <laughs> that. And, and for us to make the playoffs, it was like, man, this is unbelievable. You know, we, you know, I remember we, uh, Man, we was spraying champagne for the first. I'd never sprayed champagne in my life, and and I felt like we we partied in that locker room for about three hours after that. You know, you thought we won the World Series, so it's just you know those kind of highlights for me. Um, you know, any time we could we could, you know, we could win something as a team and and enjoy things together, it was something that I always loved. Um, and because I think if you for me if if the years that that happened, it was always a year where I felt like personally I had a good year, um, you know, won a lot of games, gave my team a, a really good chance to win. Um, you know, your teammates would feed off of that and everybody was just, you know, all the, all those teams, the early Oakland days with Zito and Mulder and, you know, Giambi and Chavi, it was like, man, we were all good because we were, we were all good together. And yeah, um, a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, obviously winning a world series in San Francisco was something that, you know, was, was, was huge for me in my career because I always thought that, you know, when you're, when you're early in your career and you're making the playoffs every year, it's like, man, you know what, hopefully I can play this game long enough. I'll have a really good chance to win a world series one day, man. Fast forward 14 years later, 15 years later, I'd never gotten past the first round of the playoffs. Yeah. You know, all those great teams in Oakland and all the good teams in Atlanta that I played for, man, we've got, we got beat in the first round every year. And, um, you know, when we finally got to San Francisco, you know, we, we wasn't a very good team in 2014. You know, at one time we were one of the worst teams in baseball. We just happened to get hot at the right time and squeak into the playoffs and ended up riding Madison Bumgarner for the playoff run. And, and But I remember sitting there, you know, in the first round thinking, man, I hope this is it because, you know, these these days are starting to get, kind of hard for me to get to yeah. the park every day. I, you see the end of the tunnel coming. And um, I remember Brandon Crawford, we were sitting there and I was just like, man, what, you know, and he was like, oh, why, why are you so nervous, man? I'm like, and I was the old guy on the team. I was like 40, you know, I'm supposed to be the dude that's like the veteran. And But these guys had done it before. I mean, they've won two right. World Series. They, they're used, they know, they knew what it was like to win. And I'm like, dude, I've never gotten past the first round. Like, I don't want to screw this up. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> don't you screw this up, you know? And meanwhile, it was like, man, I was old. And I remember pitching in game, I think it was game three and game seven. And the one one thing I was, I remember talking to Bochy, I'm like, Bochy, don't you let me screw this up. Get me out of there before I can, <laughs> you know, especially in game seven, you know, we, we got game seven against Kansas City. And I was like, he had a talk with me. He goes, hey, goes first, you know, first jam we get in, we're going to go matchups after that. And I was like, yeah, you damn right, we're going matchups after that. I said, don't, <laughs> I said, don't you dare leave me out there too long. <laughs> sure enough, second, well, that kind second, of segues. First it kind of segues into the next. Uh, it segues into the next question I have for you. Uh, you played with some great guys. Uh, you know, obviously we were fortunate in Oakland. We drafted you. We drafted Mulder. We drafted uh, Zito. Um, what was it like to pitch with those guys and who were some of your favorite teammates to play with? Yeah. I mean, those, those guys were incredible. You know, it was, um, you know, not many organizations can, <clears throat> can say that they, you know, they hit three drafts in a row with three ace type of pitchers. You know, I was, you know, 97 draft mortar was 98 Zito was 99. And in 2000, we were all in the big leagues together and all in the big leagues together doing really really cool stuff so you know that was you know they made me better taking them out with them every day um and we were all three totally different kind of guys and pitchers you know zito was a big one of the best curveballs you ever seen um good change up molder was the nastiest out of all of us i mean he was you know 94 95 with a sinker and a split at 90 and just big lefty and so it was uh I could I, looking back on, I could tell why guys had a really hard time with us because we were so totally different. 
And we all three wanted to be the best in the game. I think that was the one thing that was really cool was, and at any time we probably could have been a Cy Young winner uh, or, you know, one of the best pitchers in that league at any given year. And um, so come playoff time, I'm sure that the Yankees and the Minnesota and Boston, they were like, man, this sucks, you know, <laughs> but, at, but we were all so young that we really didn't really get, I'm just like, man, let's just go out there and have fun and win. And um, so that was awesome. You know, Jason Giambi was an unbelievable teammate. Uh, Eric Shaw. I mean, it's hard to say any any one guy. You know, Ramon Hernandez was a guy that I played with through the minor yeah. leagues, and he was my catcher, you know, in Oakland. So, uh, you know, he was he, he was one of those guys that um, he knew all of us. He, he he was a guy that could could really push the the buttons on the pitching staffs. Um, you know, Jason Isringhausen and Frankie Minakino are two guys that I to this day, you know, I. I, I keep in contact with them all the time. Frankie, Frankie will show up here in Auburn with an open-ended plane ticket every now, <laughs> every now and again. He'll be like, hey, hunt, I'm coming down to, we're going to go hunting and fishing. And, yeah. you know, he'll roll in here. And next thing you know, two weeks later, I'm like, damn, Frankie, you know, go I think home. Me, and, me and the family's about to go on vacation out of town. You know, <laughs> are you going to be here when we get back? <laughs> you know, but, um, but you know what? That's it's great just, though. I mean, that, that, that's what's so great about the game. And, you know, we we drafted all you guys. We signed most of you guys, or we traded for. I mean, the Isringhausen story, I'll, I'll save for another day. But uh, you know, it was nice because you guys all all came to the big leagues, kind of, and, and matured at the same time. And people always talk about Glavin and Maddox and Smoltz, and as great as they are, Hall of Famers and everything. If you go back and look at their careers, I tell people if you go look at Hudson, Mulder, and Zito, they came to the big leagues. They didn't come to the big leagues and just get to the big leagues. They came and gave us 200 innings and won 15, 16, 17 games. That's why we were able to be really good in at in, in a, that time because you guys never came to the big leagues and went 8 and 17, 9 and 20. You gave us the innings and we were able to build an organization around three, like you said, uh, Cy Young candidates. So it was fun to watch, and I, I and I hear the joy in your voice as you're talking about it. Yeah, it was fun. It, it was a it was an unbelievable experience for me, just because I mean we were all getting to the big leagues at the same time, um, fired up to be there, dreams coming true at the same time, and we were all really good. And that's one thing, like you said, it's 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 really um, it's really hard to to believe that, but like we we were as good our first year or two in the big leagues as we ever were in our careers. And um, it just, it was a perfect storm to, to win a championship. I look back on, I'm like, man, I had the world that we'd not win. Oh, uh, you know, I what, still have, uh, I still have nightmares. But... Yeah, I know. It's me too. It's I, I think now, if, I think we were just, I think the inexperience and just the, I think if we knew how good we were really knew, I think we'd have just rolled through people, yeah. but we were kind of, oh man, the Yankees or the Red Sox. It's like, you know, they still had that veteran yeah. thing that that's, we didn't have at the time. That, well, that that's uh, interesting comments. Um, which pitching coach helped you the most? You know what? I, I was, uh, you know, the two pitching coaches that I, that I feel like really impacted my career the, the most was, was Rick Peterson and, and Roger McDowell, th those two guys. Um, you know, obviously Rick was a guy early in my career that helped me understand mechanics and biomechanics, and which I had no clue coming out of right. Auburn and, and where I came from, it was, that wasn't really a thing. So understanding that, uh, the timing of, of, of your deliveries and, and why things work the way they do from a biomechanic standpoint, helped me understand that side of it. Um, and just the preparation and game plans, you know, and, and, and how to pitch guys and, and advanced scouting reports and, and, and why, you know, you, you do certain things with certain hitters, you know, those are things that, you know, that, that early on in my career, you know, I've really learned a lot because of that. Um, and, you know, Roger and, and Rick, I mean, they couldn't be any different when it comes to, <laughs> to guys or pitching coaches, but, you know, at this, at this, those certain times of my career, there couldn't have been a better a, a more perfect guy to to have me in, to have in my corner than those guys. When I was in Atlanta, you know, Roger was, you know, he was that veteran. The, you know, he was the, um, it was like feel, what are you, what are you feeling, you know, from a, from a, 
you know, and not so much mechanics and, and, and biomechanics. It's almost like, okay, I have that background from working with Rick all those years. Now I have, you know, the, the mental side of, of, of pitching and the, you know, the, the game within a game with a pitching coach. Um, so it was, those, those were two guys that, that, uh, that complimented me in my game, um, in, at the point of my career is when I really needed them. And I know you played for one of my favorite managers of all time, Bobby Cox, but do you have a favorite manager that you played for or a couple? Yeah. I mean, you know what? I couldn't have had three better managers uh, throughout my career with, with Art Howe and, and Bobby and, and Bochi. Um, I, I mean, it was, I mean, Art was, I couldn't have picked a better manager to break into the big leagues with. I mean, he was that guy that was, uh, he felt like a dad or grandfather yeah. type of, you know yeah. what I mean? He was older, but not too, you know, and. Um, Three great guys. Unbelievable. Awesome. Bobby was incredible. I mean, when I got traded to Atlanta, I was, <clears throat> I remember looking and sitting in the locker room. And I look across the, the locker room and there's Andrew Jones and Chipper and Smoltz and Bobby come walking through. John Sherholtz come walking through. And I was just like, Jesus, <laughs> like I grew up a Braves fan. <laughs> You know, here I am, like I'm pitching about to pitch opening day, and I got these guys in my corner with me. Like there couldn't have been couldn't have been anything cooler, um, you know. And then Bochy, I mean, it's I mean it, they were I mean I've I've had, you know, th those three guys were were um, incredible for me. Uh, you you always felt like they were on your team. You felt like they were fighting for you. Bobby was, I mean, Bobby would fight hell backwards for every any any of his teammates, any any of his players, and. Um, as players, you really appreciated that, and you just wanted to go out there and just do whatever you could to win for them. And and all three of those guys were, you know, I felt the same way. There's a special special place in my heart with with all three of those guys, and um, and for different reasons, you know. Obviously, early on in my career with with Art, you know, he he gave me a chance to to go out there and compete and win every day, along with the A's organization. And you know, Bobby was a guy I spent most of my years with. You know, nine, nine years in Atlanta. Uh, you know, playing for a team that I grew, I pulled for as a kid. So it was, it was pretty special. Well, you, you've had, you had a great career. You did a lot of amazing things. You know, um, I know you and your wife have a, uh, a foundation as you're in your retirement here. She's probably run most of it, <laughs> knowing you. Uh, but why don't you tell the people out there what it is, what it's about, uh, before we send you off here? Yeah, you know what? In 2008, we started the Hudson Family Foundation, and it's, you know, we've uh, we've always had a, a special place in our heart for for children's charities and and you know any kind of you know anytime when there's any kind of hardships going on with kids, you know, it always kind of struck a soft spot with me and my wife and. You know, we started our foundation in 2008, and, um, you know, it's two statewide. It's Alabama and Georgia, and pretty much we've, you know, have a pretty wide umbrella that we cast out with, with kids as far as helping them, uh, them and their families with any kind of hardships, whether it be, you know, health-wise or, or physically uh, having some hardships. or um, It's hard to say that if there's one thing that we help out with, but there's a lot of – there's a big area of, of, of help that we can um, – and we're proud of it. I mean, it's we've been we've been able to do some really cool things over the years, um, and I'm just honored to, to be able to have a platform to be able to to help out some kids that may not be as fortunate as I was, um, and 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 try to you know make their their way a little bit easier for them. Well, it's always a good thing to give back. It sounds like uh, you and your wife have done an amazing thing. But listen, I want to thank you so much. I it's first of all, it's great seeing you yeah. again. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure we'll have you on if we keep doing this a couple of years down the road, but uh, enjoy your retirement, your empty nest, and uh, look forward to catching up with you down the road, Tim. Yeah, JP, I appreciate you having me, and man, it was, uh, it was good catching up. Uh, man, you look a lot younger than than I probably than I probably do. <laughs> I think I think your your retirement is probably a little little easier than mine so far. <laughs> <laughs> well, enjoy yourself, and uh, we'll be catching up with you. But thanks again for doing this, Thank Tim you. Hudson, everybody. I really enjoyed listening to that segment with Hudson. Wow. Yeah, Great. he's got a lot of knowledge in there. You know, uh, he's accomplished a lot. And it's nice to hear him give you his thought process on, you know, what he was thinking, what he what he he valued as a pitcher, uh, you know, his honesty. 
uh, actually pretty humble guy for having the success that he's had, but very humble. Yeah. You just hope some young kids are out there listening and taking away from some of this stuff that it, everything isn't based on, you know, an analytical breakdown with a rap soda reach a red, red to you after every pitch you throw. And you got to really put a little thought and in, in, in time into how you're going to develop as a pitcher. But uh, yeah, Tim, Tim's a special one. He was great, great, uh, great career. And uh, it was really good to have on the show. I really uh, enjoyed having him. Yeah, I enjoyed listening. Uh, just uh, what a you know well-spoken guy, very intelligent guy. What a great career, and just a down-to-earth individual, and a uh, uh, big country music fan as well. So it's and kind you can of- see those competitive instincts. You know, you could see them still. They were coming through on the screen pretty clear, and that's why he was successful. He competed and he wanted to win. Yeah, two pretty good qualities. It was a great one, JP. Thanks for bringing them on, and that's going to wrap up uh, this week uh, on the brush back. Uh, we will be back next week with another episode. So keep tuned. Watch your social media. Follow JP on social media. Follow the show on social media. We're everywhere. Uh, share it, like it, uh, because this show really each and every week you're bringing a perspective. Uh, to the listening audience and those who watch on YouTube on the real insider's take of this game. And the guests that you've had on have been phenomenal. So I can't wait to see what you got coming up in the future, JP. So uh, listen, it's been always a pleasure to be here with you. Until next week when we return, this is John Arezzi for JP. Have a great week, everyone. <laughs>